An emergency position indicating radio beacon, a PERB, is a type of emergency locator beacon for commercial and recreational boats, a portable, battery-powered radio transmitter used in emergencies to locate boaters in distress and in need of immediate rescue. In the event of an emergency, such as a ship sinking or medical emergency on board, an APERB is an emergency position indicating radio beacon, which is used as a distress alerting system indicating to search and rescue authorities both the identity and position of a vessel, which is in grave and imminent danger and requires immediate assistance. APERB is a small, self-contained, battery-operated radio transmitter which is both watertight and buoyant. They also transmit a distinctive swept audio tone signal on the international aeronautical distress frequencies of 121.5 MHz for homing purposes by search and rescue aircraft. APERBs can also transmit a GNSS position, provided it is fed from an internal or external GNSS device. The hydrostatic release in the bracket is designed to release the beacon when the bracket is submerged to a certain depth. Operating procedures differ between models, however all beacons incorporate a multi-position switch that selects the following modes of operation. Off or safe, the beacon is switched off and will not transmit. On or manual, the beacon will switch on and transmit immediately. Test activates a built-in self-test routine. The key components of an APERB are Antenna, it must be near vertical when operating, transmitting. C-switch, activates the APERB automatically when submerged in water. Activation switch, enables to activate APERB manually. Test button, enables the user to run test sequences to verify the readiness of the APERB. Lanyard, the cord is used to tether the APERB to a life raft. Strobe light, when the APERB is activated it will flash and give a visual aid to search and rescue unit. LEDs and buzzer, are used to show which mode the APERB is in and to show the result of the APERB test sequences. Internal battery supply which lasts for at least 48 hours. GPS position fixing system in most but not all models. It enables SAR operation to start instantaneously. APERBs may either be portable and capable of being manually activated or they must be able to be deployed automatically without any operator intervention. APERB divided for two categories. Category 2 is manually activated and Category 1 has an automatic release and deployment mechanism. This usually allows the APERB to be mounted externally and to be deployed automatically once it is below 6 feet of water, allowing the unit to float to the surface and transmit its emergency message. As per IMO Resolution MSC 471 all vessels required to be equipped with APERB Category 1, with automatic release and deployment mechanism. APERB supplied with a plastic enclosure in which the C-switch of the APERB is deactivated. The plastic enclosure contains a spring-loaded lever which automatically pushes the enclosure lid off and releases the APERB if the vessel sinks. This automatic ejection is controlled by a device called hydrostatic release unit that will automatically release the APERB once a depth of approximately 4 to 5 meters is reached. APERB uses the COSPA SARSET system. It operates all over the globe without geographical restrictions. The system comprises of a space segment operating in low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit, a ground segment consisting of satellite receiving stations, known as local user terminals and data distribution centers. I would like to divide APERBs into two groups, old and new. Old models of APERBs, installed on vessels before July 2022, complied with the requirements of Resolution A810, which did not mandate the presence of GPS in the device. However, new APERBs installed on board vessels after the specified date must adhere to the standards outlined in Resolution MS-471 Annex 24. These standards stipulate the mandatory inclusion of a GNSS receiver and automatic identification system in the APERB. A distinguishing feature of modern APERBs, compared to old types of emergency radio beacons, is that they include a GPS receiver and transmit their location, typically with an accuracy of up to 100 meters to facilitate search and rescue operations. Previous emergency radio beacons without GPS could be located with an accuracy of up to 5 kilometers using COSPA's satellites. 
As I mentioned before, the COSPA-SARSAT system consists of low-Earth orbit and geostationary orbit satellites. LIASAR, the COSPA-SARSAT LIASAR system uses polar orbiting satellites, with an orbital period of approximately 120 minutes. The satellites view an area of the Earth over 6,000 kilometers wide as they orbit the globe. However, it has limitations due to intermittent coverage by these satellites. Low altitude. Unlocking excellence in EHS learning. Welcome to a transformative e-learning. Two orbiting satellites create a strong Doppler effect in the uplink signal, allowing for Doppler positioning techniques. When the LIASAR system detects distress alert, it calculates the location of the distress event using Doppler processing techniques. Doppler processing is based upon the principle that the frequency of the distress beacon, as heard by the satellite instrument, is affected by the relative velocity of the satellite with respect to the beacon. By monitoring the change of the beacon frequency of the received beacon signal and knowing the exact position of the satellite, the LIASAR system is able to calculate the location of the beacon with an accuracy of within 5 to 10 kilometers. The satellite system takes 90 minutes on average to calculate the initial position from a beacon which is not GPS equipped, but it may take up to 5 hours, depending on the conditions. The LIASAR system operates in two coverage modes, namely local and global coverage. Local coverage mode, a repeater on board the satellite relays the APERB signals directly to ground where it is received and processed by a LUT. If both a beacon and a LUT are simultaneously within view of a satellite the APERB transmissions can be processed immediately. A satellite covers an area within approximately 2,000 kilometers either side of its track over the ground. If a LUT is not within view of a satellite the information from the APERB which is relayed to Earth is lost. This fact limits the detection and location of APERBs operating in the real-time mode to particular geographical areas surrounding a LUT. Global coverage mode, signals from an activated 406 MHz APERB are frequency and time tagged and stored in the satellite's memory. As the satellite's path brings it into view of a LUT information, including the beacon unique identifier, frequency of detection and time of detection, is continuously relayed down to the LUT. The global coverage mode is so described because it does not suffer the geographical limitations of the real-time mode and allows detection and location anywhere on the Earth's surface. It is this fact that makes 406 MHz APERBs acceptable for the GMDSS. The LUT, after computing the location of the emergency beacon using Doppler processing, transmits an alert message to its associated MCC. The MCC performs matching and merging of alert messages with other messages received, sorts the data geographically and subsequently transmits a distress message to another MCC, an appropriate search and rescue authority such as a National Rescue Coordination Center, RCC, or a foreign SAR point of contact, SPOC. GEOSAR, geostationary satellites orbit the Earth at an altitude of 36,000 kilometers, with an orbit period of 24 hours, thus appearing fixed relative to the Earth at approximately zero degrees latitude, i.e. over the equator. A single geostationary satellite provides GEOSAR uplink coverage of about one-third of the globe, except for polar regions. Therefore, Three geostationary satellites equally spaced in longitude can provide continuous coverage of all areas of the globe between approximately 70 degrees north and 70 degrees south latitude. In order to make effective use of search and rescue instruments in geostationary orbits, new 406 MHz distress beacons have been introduced with the capability to accept position information from internal or external navigation devices such as GPS receivers. This has the potential to provide near instantaneous alerting and locating via the GEOSAR system. A GPS-equipped beacon has a location accuracy of 120 meters and location is provided by GEO satellites within minutes. When the two systems are combined COSPA SARSAT is able to provide a robust capability by providing Global LIASAR coverage Near instantaneous GEOSAR coverage Independent LIASAR Doppler positioning High probability of detection with the LIASAR system anywhere on land or at sea, even in situations where obstacles block the beacon transmission to a GEOSAR satellite. High system capacity. 
the satellites in the two types of orbit are considered complementary. While the GEO satellites offer near instantaneous detection of 406 MHz distress beacons, they do not provide Doppler locating capabilities and their field of view is limited to the area between 70 degrees north and 70 degrees south. The LEO satellites provide global coverage and Doppler locating capabilities but have an inherent delay given their orbital characteristics and field of view. What happens when an APERB is activated? Each APERB in the world has a unique identifier. The identity includes a three-digit country code. This is the country that takes responsibility for storing that particular APERB's registration details. When an APERB is activated in an emergency it begins to transmit radio signals that includes also its identity number. After receipt of APERB signals the satellite relays the signals to a LUT. Lealit and Geolit Earth-based ground stations receive and process Midnight. distress alerts from APERBs relaying distress information, comprising casualty ID, position and UTC time to mission control centers. Their main purpose and function is to relay APERB distress alert information to the appropriate MRCC who coordinates the deployment of search and rescue units in the search and rescue region in which the casualty is located. MRCC will then decode the country code from the message. After that they will access the registration database for that country and expect to find details of the vessel to which the APERB belongs to, its radio equipment and who to contact. Then, they will start with SAR operation. SAR vessel, helicopter, plane involved in SAR operation will try to find APERB based on its radio signal with the direction finding equipment. In conclusion, APERB and the COSPAS SARSET system provide a reliable rescue system in emergency situations at sea and far from the shore. These technologies play a crucial role in ensuring the safety of seafarers, offering swift detection and coordinated rescue efforts. I hope you found this information helpful. Thank you. A search and rescue transponder, SART, is an electronic device that automatically reacts to the emission of a radar. This enhances the visibility on a radar screen. SART transponders are used to ease the search of a ship in distress or a life raft. All GMDSS vessels up to 500 ton must carry at least one SART. A SART operates in the 9 GHz, 3 cm, or X-band, radar frequency band and, on receiving a signal from a ship or aircraft radar, transmits a series of response, homing, signals. The SART can be activated manually or automatically, in some cases, so that it will thereafter respond when interrogated. So you've entered your survival craft, but now you need to be rescued. Even with ships searching in the correct area, narrowing down your exact location can be a real challenge. That's where a SART can help. They attract the attention of passing vessels by actually drawing on their radar screen. Activated correctly, it will point the searchers in the right direction increasing your chances of being rescued. SART stands for Search and Rescue Transponder. It's an active device, meaning it transmits a signal to draw attention to itself. It's triggered when it detects a pulse from a radar. As soon as it does, it transmits multiple pulses straight back, painting a series of 12 distinctive echoes on the screen, guiding the searching vessel towards its location. They operate at 9 GHz, which means they show up on an X-band 3cm radar screen. Day to day, the units themselves require very little maintenance. All you need to do is make sure they're clean and dry, check the battery expiry date, and test them monthly. Every unit is different, so you do need to check the instructions. On this unit, you can just slide the switch to the test position to temporarily activate it. It will indicate whether the internal test is successful, often with a light. If you have radar, you can also check the screen to check it's responding correctly. In an actual emergency, you need to make sure you take it with you. There's no rush to activate it, especially if you're still close to your original vessel. 
That will paint a large echo anyway, and may even block the SART's transmission. Once you are clear, you can then set it up. To activate the SART, you normally just need to remove a pin. It should then indicate to you that it's working. Once active, it needs to be mounted as high as possible. The higher it is, the further away it will be detected. In the water, you can expect only a mile or so. On the floor of a life raft, it's not much better, maybe two or three miles, if you're lucky. But mounting one meter high, it must be able to be detected at least five miles away. One meter is the height of IMO performance standards, and it should have been designed to comply with that. SARTs have enough battery to last 96 hours in standby mode, that's four days, and eight hours in transmission mode. Of course, it should only actually be in transmission mode when another vessel is close enough to detect it. If you have multiple SARTs, it's important to only activate one at a time. Using one ensures that the radar return maintains its distinctive nature and can't be confused with another echo. The other point to note is to never use a SART and a radar reflector close together. There's always a chance that the radar reflector will block the SART signal. Once it's all set up, you just need to wait for a radar to be close enough to activate the SART. For the approaching vessel, the first sign that there's a SART operating is the characteristic dots on their radar screen. At long range, these show as 12 dots in a line originating from the SART's location. The first return is the SART itself, and the further dots are the extra echoes generated by the SART. The extra echoes will be 0.6 miles apart, so they can be seen best on a 6 or a 12 mile range setting, as they will span a total of 7.2 miles across the screen. The precise range that the SART is first detected does vary. We've already spoken about the importance of mounting height, Another major factor is the height of the radar looking for it. For surface craft with a scanner height of 15 meters, you can expect those performance standards of 5 miles for a correctly mounted SART. This then increases for bigger ships with higher radar scanners. The greatest range will be from aircraft searching around 3,000 feet. They may pick it up at even 40 miles away. Once the SART begins generating these extra echoes, it indicates to its user that it's under interrogation. Often this is by a flashing light or an audible signal. It tells the survivors there's an X-band radar operating nearby, and should act as somewhat of a morale boost. Knowing that there are vessels close by is also a good indication that traditional flares will be spotted. Even at maximum range, rocket parachute flares should still be visible to the vessel that has activated the SART. Hopefully, now the SART, or maybe even the flares, have attracted the attention of the other vessel. They can use the shape of the echo to locate the survival craft. As they draw nearer, the dots on their radar screen become arcs. This is because the scanner is picking up the returns across a larger angle. The closer it gets, the larger the angle that the scanner can detect the SART, so the larger the arcs become on the screen. Eventually, the arcs become full circles, showing that the approaching vessel is now very close to the SART's location. If all goes well, the survival craft should be clearly visible, and survivors can be rescued. They're not cheap, but if you're... Three types of visual distress signals. One visual signals. Two sound signals. Three radio signals such as... Morse Group SOS. The first step is to always have your VHF radio on before heading out on the water. And adjust your volume and swell so that you can hear other traffic calling on the radio. The radio is now ready for calling and receiving calls on channel 16. Now let's imagine your vessel is in distress and requires immediate assistance. While lifting the key cover, hold down Distress for 3 seconds to transmit the distress call. While holding down Distress, countdown beep sound and both the key and display backlighting blink. DSC, channel 70, 
is automatically selected and the distress call is transmitted. The distress call is automatically transmitted every three to five minutes until an acknowledgement is received or a DSC cancel call is made. Push resend to manually transmit the distress repeat call. Push the right key and then push info to display the transmitted distress call information. A distress alert default contains your MMSI number, nature of distress, and position information. After transmitting the call, the transceiver waits for an acknowledgement call. Let's direct the simulator to send an acknowledgement call. After receiving the acknowledgement, push alarm off, then reply using the microphone. Since there is no voice communication on channel 70, and recognizing that not all vessels are equipped with DSC, once the distress call is issued on channel 70 by pressing the red distress button, you should issue a verbal mayday call. The M506 radio will automatically switch to channel 16 after using the distress button 